Welcome, everybody, to this sunny afternoon here at St. Thomas's. Before we start, just two words of thanks. Firstly, to Kate and to Lynn for their hard work in setting this up, and for all your volunteers. Many, many thanks for doing this. Um, secondly, we've, we've got a, a little questionnaire. I, I hope you'll help us, because it, it's just to see how many have family histories suggestive of the Hughes syndrome. And I'd like, if anyone who can fill it in, if there's some questions you don't know about, leave them out. But, and that's not just patients, but your accompanying persons who happen to be the controls then, if you see what I mean. So uh, I'd be very grateful if you can. The bottom word is POTS. You may not know what that is, but you will hear a little bit more about it later on. I apologize. So my first slide is here. Um, in October, it was the 30th anniversary of discovering the syndrome. And every two years now, there's a world conference on this. And in October, it was held in South America, in Rio. Uh, I don't recommend Rio to anyone. It rains, and I was there for a day, and it's not nice. But the meeting was fantastic. There were 650 doctors from all over the world interested in this topic. And I had to give the opening lecture. And what I I'm going to do in the next 10, 15 minutes is give you a summary of what I talked about there. The title they gave me was what's happened in 30 years, what have we learned in 30 years? And the way I thought I'd do it at that meeting, I'm going to do here, based on just five GP's letters. Um, and that's what we deal with all, all the time, GP's, ourselves and patients. Just a quick background, it was 30 years ago in October that we published our observations on this syndrome in British journals, in The Lancet and in the British Medical Journal. And for us, as you can imagine, it was a very exciting time because we knew this was, was going to be important. Um, a number of publications came in the next two years. Oh, this thing isn't working. Not working. Okay, this was one of the papers in the British Medical Journal. We called it Thrombosis, Abortion, Cerebral Disease, and the Lupus Anticoagulant, which, as you know, is a very silly name for it. These were the young team that we had in, my, in Hammersmith in those days, and a, a number of them visiting fellows from overseas. In the top right-hand corner, as you look at it, Charles Mackworth Young, who is my registrar, who's now at Westminster, and at the back, um, in the African gentleman with the big hair is now the Dean of, of the University of the West Indies. So he's gone on to far bigger and better things, but a fantastic team. Um, we then held the first World Symposium. That was a grand title because um, it was at Hammersmith and we invited people from all over the world. And I got my secretary to do four desks with A to D, E to G, and so on, and the 34 people came. So that was the first international meeting. We moved to St. Thomas's here in uh, 1985, and so we carried on the tradition, and we had the second World Conference here, and since then it's not looked back. Medically, there have been these every two years World Conferences. These are some of the world leaders in this field, and it is very international. Top left, Nigel Harris, Center, Munther Kamashta, who I think no, no introduction needed, he'll be speaking next. Uh, on the top right, sadly, who died recently from cancer, Silvia Pierangeli, a great worker. At the bottom, two from Italy, and then John Charles Piet, a good friend from Paris, who did a lot of sterling work. He's given up uh, hospital medicine and is now the medical doctor to Formula One racing cars. So, so very quickly, as a clinician, what is Hughes syndrome? And I'm going to just briefly do five quick diagnostic letters from doctors. The diagnosis, the family, pregnancy, <clears throat> the heart sink patient, and treatment hurdles. So doctor's letter number one concerns diagnosis. Dear Dr. Hughes, regarding Mrs. Smith, although I suspect APS, She's never had a thrombosis or a miscarriage. My first lesson is that, many of you know this, antiphospholipid syndrome <coughs> is not just thrombosis and miscarriage. And in fact, many patients have had neither. 
for instance, some people get metatarsal fractures. They, they jogging or break their bones while, while walking. There was a condition called March fracture, which new soldiers sometimes got in the foot. And we see this in a number of patients with Hughes syndrome, possibly because of poor circulation to the bone. We see the heart involved with murmurs. Many of our patients are found to have murmurs and very occasionally they get valve damage and need valve clotting and valve surgery. <coughs> they can get balance problems and ringing in the ears. And we're getting referred now more and more patients from the ENT doctors, patients referred with uh, swimming heads and so on. Very, very common presentation. Many as is a label given to many of them. But perhaps the two commonest are memory loss, brain fog. And this, when you ask the patient about it, often is the number one overriding thing. Doctor, I could not remember which exit, you know, from the roundabout when I've taken my child to school or I'm the joke of the family. The skin is involved. This is what we call levido, blotchy. One of my patients called it corned beef skin. It's a cold circulation and we see it. But next to memory loss, by far the most important common feature of this syndrome, number two, is migraine. And it often starts in the teens, it often goes away and comes back in their 20s or 30s, often a family history of migraine. And it's a terribly, terribly important and common feature of the syndrome. It's important because the migraine doctors who are here will know if you anticoagulate patients, the migraines often stop completely. Multiple sclerosis. Uh, some of our patients are wrongly labeled as MS because they have balance problems, visual disturbances, and some of the features of MS. And it's actually, we still don't know, if you go to an MS clinic, what percentage of those patients have not got MS but have Hughes syndrome, whether it's 5%, we just don't know. Doctor's letter number two, the family. I should go back. Dear Dr. Hughes, read Mrs. Jones. Despite a history of migraines, low platelets, a previous infarct, all tests for APS are negative. Her sister, who has APS, has responded to anticoagulation. Should we follow suit? Yes, yes, yes. This lady, Mrs. Jones, was treated with first aspirin, then heparin, then warfarin. Headache's gone, and she's probably in the audience and doing very well. What is this patient teaching us? Well, this family is, is kind of interesting. She had four brothers and sisters. Oh, this is playing games. Can I, can I ask your help? Can I just wave to you? Um, so, thank you. David is 50, had migraine, had a pulmonary embolus, which is a major clot. But his test for sticky blood negative. And migraine, pulmonary embolus, multiple sclerosis. Can you imagine that label? She didn't have MS, she, and, but she was positive. Tina, memory loss, and went to live abroad and died of a pulmonary embolism. And actually, whilst abroad, was tested and found to be positive for the test, sticky blood. And finally, headache, DVT, uh, negative. Next slide, please. So this brings up this vexed question of seronegative. And Muntha Kamashtra and I wrote a paper many years ago saying that we are seeing patients who have all the features of the disease, but where the tests are unhelpful or negative. Exactly as we see with thyroid, every week of the year, normal thyroid function with a patient with a lazy thyroid. Next slide, please. So does it exist? Well, it may be not. It may be the wrong diagnosis. It may be that tests were positive and are now negative, and occasionally we see that. I, I think what we all agree who are working with this subject is that we need more sensitive new tests. Next slide, please. Doctor's lesson number three, pregnancy. And that's going to be talked about, next slide please, by Dr. Kamashta, who is here, with his beard and good, good head of hair. Um, and this has been the fantastic story. This is, you'll hear from, uh, has been the headline story of the antiphospholipid syndrome. The patient on the left had, I think, nine, 10 miscarriages and is now well. She was treated with heparin during her pregnancy. And this combined clinic, which is hematology and obstetrics and uh, lupus doctors. And that success rate now, under 20, now over 90% success in pregnancy. Next slide, please. 
So dear Dr. Gamashta, read Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith's had a stillbirth. Could APS be a risk factor? Stillbirth, late pregnancy loss. Next slide, please. About six months ago, the Times did a thundering column on the stillbirth scandal. Every day, as many as three babies are stillborn. Next slide, please. We now know that uh, stillbirth is associated with antiphospholipid syndrome. And this paper by Ware Branch, who's a friend and colleague, and Rob Silver in Utah in the United States, showed a three to five-fold increase odds of stillbirth if you are sticky blood. Next slide, please. Now, the bad news, and this comes from work by many of you in the audience working with the charity, is that um, pregnancy testing in the UK is still rather primitive. We looked at, or they looked at, 11 UK trusts. Five didn't include anticardiolipin assays. And even in this hospital, which is the center of the world of APS, if you like, this does not include ACL in standard screening. But it does include syphilis, for goodness sake, 16 pounds. Next slide, please. Um, so I hit on the idea, maybe obstetric doctors should be taught to look for at-risk patients, because they do not test patients until there are three miscarriages, and that will lead on to a very stormy issue here. Why wait that long? Next slide, please. And the three simple questions are, have you had a thrombosis? Are you a migraine sufferer? And do you have a family history of autoimmune disease like lupus, rheumatoid, MS, or thyroid disease? And I'm sure that would pick out those in whom you could spend a tenor testing. Next slide, please. Doctor's letter number four, the heart sink patient. And every, every profession has a heart sink patient or a, or a, or a client. And the next slide, please, um, is a terribly um, politically incorrect letter I received many years ago. <laughs> Dear Dr. Hughes, I'm delighted to tell you you've won Mrs. Shuttleworth in our hospital draw. Next slide, please. This is Mrs. Shuttleworth. And this is what she sent me. These are her symptoms. Fatigue, headaches, blurred vision, short of breath, tummy pains, knee pain, cold feet, fainting, fainting attacks in school, um, poor memory, dry mouth, palpitations, hip pain. And you know as well as I do, these are all very real. This patient was not um, just malingering. Next slide, please. This patient, next slide, had Hughes syndrome and POTS. And I did not know what POTS was, but it's a postural tachycardia. In other words, when you, when you stand up, you get the heart goes the wrong way, it gets faster, and you lose your blood pressure, and you faint. And my colleague, who's, who's in the audience, uh, Jill, I don't know if you want to talk about this later, but has collected a dozen or so patients, next slide, please, with a combination, fainting, fatigue, migraines, aches and pains. Next slide, please. Uh, Jill Schofield, I think it's out, you said, I haven't seen it yet, but it's uh, 14 cases of POTS. Is this of any significance to us in the Hughes syndrome? Next slide, please. Well, we think it does have therapeutic implications. Next slide. This is an email I re received from a patient of mine, and she, we started her on anticoagulant for the Hughes syndrome. It's very interesting. Within 48 hours of starting heparin, headaches gone, tinnitus gone, Stomach pain's gone, that's gastric ischemia. Numbness in the hands, gone, and so on. Visual disturbance, better. Brain fog, improving. Next slide, please. And what's very interesting is that these had not responded to conventional POTS treatment. So I think the ripples for the clinician keep on widening. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next, last doctor's letter, the treatment problems. I'm not going to go into detail because many are covering this today. But the last doctor's letter, next slide please, says, Dear Mrs. Jones, despite being on warfarin, her memory loss, headaches, and balance problems have not improved. Next slide please. So what's this patient teaching us? Well, first of all, that failure is, is part of medicine. Next slide. And we see this all the time. And I've shown this before, but this cartoon drawing shows what we see with many patients with the Hughes syndrome on warfarin that they're okay when the INR is high. In other words, the blood flow is good and quick and thin. But when it, INR falls, for example, in this lady below three, the headaches, the dysarthria, the brain fog comes down. And that's one of the reasons we're having a talk today on self-testing, which to me is, is terribly important. Next slide, please. 
and the next one. So I want to end with predictions. This I, I was asked to, to do uh, for the World Lupus Conference. I, I didn't go, but we sent some slides. And it, they asked me to get, what are my predictions for APS in the year 2050? Next slide, please. Well, the first one is the next conference won't be in Rio or London. It'll be in the, on the moon at the Disney Conference Center, and you'll get there by ro rocket. Next slide, please. And these are my predictions. APL testing will now be worldwide. Next slide, please. It'll be over the counter. There'll be kits available, and we'll do away with the dreadful test, the lupus anticoagulant test. Next slide, please. There will be new hope for migraine sufferers, and I know there are migraine doctors in the audience, but for me, this is crying out to be studied in a very big way, and there's no very good study as yet. Next slide, please. I believe that migraine is possibly linked with stroke through sticky blood. A very big paper in January from America showing some patients with certain type of migraine had a higher risk of stroke, but unfortunately they didn't test for the antibodies. Next slide, please. I believe that the stillbirth scandal, next slide, please, which is regarded by some people as the worst tragedy that can happen to, to mankind, will be alleviated. If we could test those patients with recurrent miscarriages earlier or patients at risk, we could put it off. Next slide, please. And maybe, I predict, cut the frequency of this tragedy. Next slide, please. Chest pain I'm not talking about, but many of our patients do get chest pains, and it's just the heart not being happy with low oxygen, just as the brain isn't. And I think uh, we now are beginning to hear from the cardiologists about angina, especially in younger women, being associated with Hughes syndrome. Next slide, please. And finally, the brain fog. Uh, that, that, of course, is the biggest study, and it requires really careful study, collaborating with uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, and so on. Next slide, please. But I think that some cases of memory loss, as you know in this audience, are, are very, very treatable. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, we've, we've um, talked about psychiatry. It's touching on obstetrics for sure. I think this is a neurological disease more than any other. And I think in future talks, we will have neurologists here, not just rheumatologists and hematologists. Gastroenterologists are becoming involved. Orthopedics, I mentioned fractures. I think Dr. Kamashta has a lady with 52 fractures. Um, and cardiology. Next slide, please. So I wanted to, to end by saying 30 years on, the syndrome gets wider. We think there's a better understanding, although not fully understood, of the mechanisms. And I think that the concept of seronegative antiphospholipid is arguably the, the most important single aspect of this whole syndrome right now. And that's one of the reasons I want you in the audience to perhaps fill this in. Because many of my seronegative patients have come for one reason, that their sister, their mother, their aunt has got the syndrome, and they've looked it up on the internet. And genetic studies will be useless until they recognize all these wider features of the syndrome. Next slide, please. Back in 1983, in the BMJ, I picked up this rather breathless quote, actually, but it was, for those of us hardened into nihilism by years of study of various autoantibodies in lupus, there's a rare sense of excitement at the implications of the associations now being reported. And I think 30 years on, that excitement for us, anyway, is still continuing. Thank you very much. Next slide. <laughs>